Good afternoon, everybody. Um, before we get into the main part of the webinar, I wanted to introduce the Minnesota Health Plans Collaborative. Um, this collaborative was put together in 2021 and is a uh, was come together to improve diabetes care in Minnesota for seniors and SMBC members. Um, the collaborative is a three-year project with Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Health Partners, Hennepin Health, Medica, South Country Health Alliance, and UCARE. So as I said, the collaborative came together, um, the managed care organizations to look at diabetes and improving diabetes care for our members. Um, the project was started in 2021 and goes through 2023. And other focuses um, are looking at healthcare disparities along with the essential role in educating, supporting and assisting members in achieving goals for their diabetes care. So with that, I will pass it to my colleague, Michelle, to introduce our speaker. Hi, everyone. I'm Michelle Gross, as Justin said, and I am the dental program manager at South Country Health Alliance. We're really glad all of you could join us, and I would like to introduce you to today's speaker who we feel is the ideal person to share this information with us. Dr. Jesse Grants is a full-time general dentist at Apple Tree Dental's newest center for dental health in Fairmont, Minnesota. He's a graduate of the University of Minnesota School of Dentistry in 2021. He has a passion for working with patients with special health care needs and has a holistic approach to oral health care, especially focusing on managing systemic disease and nutrition to help break cycles of disease. In addition to clinical care, he is part of Apple Tree Dental's research and innovations teams, which allow him to be part of the Southern Minnesota Early Childhood Dental Network and to give presentations like this. He's also a part-time student at the University of Massachusetts online program working towards a master's degree in public health nutrition so that he can help decrease barriers to care through teaching and advocacy. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Dr. Grants. All right, thank you so much for the introduction, Michelle. Um, so yeah, it is my pleasure to be with all of you today. Thank you so much for joining for this webinar. Um, and I am quite happy to kind of share my perspective um, on oral health considerations for people with diabetes or patients with diabetes, depending on your perspective. Um, and as uh, was previously said, I work at the Fairmont Center for Dental Health um, that is run by Apple Tree Dental down here in Fairmont um, in very far southern Minnesota. So we'll go ahead and get started. So for today, we're going to be doing um, kind of a brief overview from a clinical point of view of diabetes. Um, just since we don't know what background everybody is coming from, we want to kind of um, just give a couple of sort of basic, the basic science of diabetes. Um, we'll go over the clinical management of diabetes, as well as some of its oral, the oral health impacts of the disease. And we'll talk about lifestyle management, nutrition, things like that. And finally, we'll end with a question and answer session. So hyperglycemia um, is when blood glucose levels are abnormally high, and this is the primary symptom of diabetes. So the causes of hyperglycemia um, typically come from low insulin levels in the blood, which can either occur when there's insufficient insulin that's produced by the pancreas, or when the insulin is not used effectively or efficiently by the body. So this kind of characterizes the difference between insulin-dependent diabetes and non-insulin-dependent diabetes. So that's type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes. And another cause of hyperglycemia or high blood glucose is eating more than planned or exercising less than planned according to the amount of insulin taken. So these are going to be um, primary considerations for people who have an insulin-dependent um, type of diabetes diagnosis. And it can also come around as a result of stress, um, either physical stress from related to illnesses or things like that, or other things like medical and dental procedures or emotional stress or trauma. 
The symptoms of hyperglycemia include things like high levels of sugar in the urine. This is one of the most frequent indicators of um, a diabetes diagnosis. It's one of the first things doctors look for in the, that diagnosis. Um, also characterized by frequent urination, um, increased thirst, fatigue, and blurred vision. And you can also see on our graphic over here um, that things like slow healing cuts and sores um, are another big consideration that we definitely take into account when looking at oral health. Untreated hyperglycemia can cause damage to a lot of body systems, including especially the cardiovascular system, circulatory nervous system, and to, uh, disruptions in vision. And as I mentioned before, um, it can also result in slowed wound healing, um, which can cause some issues um, when dealing with dental considerations, especially with invasive procedures like extractions. Um, prolonged hyperglycemia can also cause a life-threatening condition called ketoacidosis, which is when the liver starts metabolizing fats in the body. Um, if there's too much, if the uh, if the sugar um, that is in your bloodstream can't get into the cells, if the insulin isn't allowing it into the cells, then the body is going to start looking for other means of energy. So it's going to start destroying those fat deposits um, and creating ketone bodies, um, which can, when they're built up, can cause lots of uh, long-term problems um, and can be a, an immediate life-threatening problem. And on the flip side, you may have also heard of hypoglycemia, um, which is a low concentration of glucose in the bloodstream. And this can be, a, uh, can be caused by uh, an adverse effect of taking insulin or other diabetes medications. So if you have too much insulin, um, you're gonna end up with lower than um, typical sugar in the bloodstream. It can also be caused by disruptions in food intake, um, such caused by things like timing of appointments. If you have an appointment that's during something that's a normal meal time, it can cause your glucose to go a little bit lower than normal. Um, can also be caused by um, excess release of liquids from things like vomiting, diarrhea, or skipping meals. Um, and it can also uh, come around from increased physical activity or unplanned physical activity and stresses. So some symptoms of hypoglycemia, um, for the mild to moderate category, you'll see things like shakiness and sweating or fast heartbeat can cause kind of dizziness or lightheadedness as well, um, can absolutely cause hunger and sweating and uh, things like difficulty concentrating or confusion. So these are certainly things that we want to take into consideration during dental appointments. Um, we want to make sure that everyone is safe um, in order to go about making decisions. Um, so things like that difficulty concentrating can certainly be an issue. Um, and if hypoglycemia gets severe, um, it can cause an inability to eat or drink um, and can even lead to seizures and convulsions and finally things like unconsciousness. So some basic clinical considerations for patients with diabetes. Um, first of all, we wanna make sure that all our patients have eaten an adequate breakfast prior to the appointment, especially for um, diabetic patients. This is gonna be really important to make sure that they keep that blood sugar level at a nice comfortable, nice, comfortable level so that they are not having any of those impairments in decision-making um, or uh, agitation, things like that, that can, can come around from having too high or too low blood sugar. Um, we want to ensure that the patient has access to insulin if they're an insulin dependent or type 1 diabetic. Um, so we always want to make sure that um, people have access to any medications that they need and typically um, insulin tablets or insulin as well as glucose tablets are available in medical kits um, that are at each dental office. So if a patient is having symptoms of low blood sugar, um, if they're having any shakiness, if they're starting to have um, kind of issues with understanding what's going on um, or getting dizzy, things like that, um, then we can give high sugar uh, drinks like orange juice or go straight to things like glucose tablets or gel that are found in our emergency kits. We also want to try to avoid sudden dental chair movements that can make patients feel lightheaded. 
So some oral manifestations of uncontrolled diabetes uh, can include things like these, um, things like dry mouth or xerostomia. Um, that's one of the one of the symptoms of diabetes, um, and that can be caused by uh, issues that diabetes can um, cause with uh, in, enlargement of things like salivary glands that can reduce saliva production. Um, you can feel things like burning sensations in the mouth. Um, it can, as as we've mentioned as well, it can cause some delayed wound healing, which is particularly impactful in extraction surgical cases. And it can also cause an increased severity of infections. So even things um, like opportunistic infections like uh, candidiasis, or um, which is a fungal infection caused by candida albicans, um, is something that we want to be more on the lookout for, especially in our patient, our diabetic patients with things like dentures, where um, candidiasis or those fungal infections can be a little bit more common. And finally, um, oral or gingivitis and periodontitis or gum inflammation and gum disease, as they're more commonly known, are also things that are going to be a little bit more common in patients with diabetes. And I'll talk a little bit more about that moving forward here. So diabetes and periodontitis um, are have a bidirectional relationship, which means that one can be predictive or causative of the other, um, and it, it does work both ways. So hyperglycemia um, or high blood glucose can affect the oral health, um, while periodontitis can also affect glycemic control. There have been multiple studies um, that have been done that have shown higher HbA1c levels um, in excuse me, um, periodontitis can be associated with higher HbA1c levels um, compared to non-diabetic people and people with type 2 diabetes. So that's showing that the periodontitis or the bone or gum disease can be associated with those uncontrolled levels of HbA1c. It can also um, lead to worsened complications um, in people with type 2 diabetes. And then um, more complications in general in patients with type 1 diabetes. So um, it can be a lot more difficult to keep um, your gums at healthy levels um, and reduce inflammation if you already have diabetes. And it can also lead to diabetes if you have uncontrolled inflammation um, in the gums and other places in the body, they can lead to a diabetes diagnosis. So within the um, dental catalog of codes, um, some of these may be more relevant to some of you than others, but we have certain things that um, are typically utilized a little bit more often in patients who have diabetes. So the standard um, cleaning, the prophylaxis code, um, typically most patients are going to be on a six-month standard recall. Um, but when we have patients who are higher risk for gum disease and things like that, like our diabetic patients, sometimes we also use a three-month recall code. Um, and then the periodontal treatment, because of that bidirectional relationship between periodontitis and diabetes, um, one of the things that we always recommend is that if we're starting to see signs of bone loss or gum disease, um, we usually recommend early intervention with scaling and root planing, um, which is where they kind of go below the below the gum level in order to clean off anything that's any deposits that are starting to accumulate on the teeth. That also helps to reduce the overall inflammation in the mouth as those gums can then um, kind of reattach to the root surface. Um, another thing that we typically use uh, with pediatric visits um, is fluoride varnishes. Um, so fluoride treatment is pretty common um, when dealing with kids who are at a higher risk for developing decay just because of oral hygiene um, habits that are still developing. Um, but it's also something that we can use with uh, higher risk patients um, like our patients with diabetes, um, sometimes also with uh, geriatric patients as well who are starting to develop issues with getting their teeth fully cleaned. Um, and on a similar note, uh, we have a relatively new intervention, um, which is a category called caries arresting agents. And the most common of those that we use is called silver diamine fluoride. Um, so this is a basically a liquid medication um, that I always describe to patients as kind of like an advanced fluoride treatment. So it has uh, silver particles in the in the compound which are antibacterial, and they can kind of kill off the bacteria that are already involved in small decay, small spots of decay or uh, what we call incipient decay or decay that's still in the enamel. 
um, that is still considered kind of reversible. So if there are patients who have a lot of these kind of areas of root decay or incipient decay, um, this can be a good, uh, a good way to stop those from progressing to the point where we would need to do lots of fillings on those patients. Um, one of the other things that we do see uh, from time to time is a code called treatment of post-surgical complications. Um, so again, with having that delayed healing um, and other issues like that with inflammation, um, sometimes we do run into more post-surgical complications with these patients. So um, sometimes that means like removing a, uh, a bone splinter that's causing uh, delays in healing or things like that. Um, but we typically just see a little bit of delayed wound healing and um, other things that we need to use, like uh, um, we need to use eugenol treatments for um, dry socket. Um, and things like that, that can be sort of other post-surgical complications. And one of the other things that we sometimes use for um, patients who have really chronically enlarged gingiva um, is called a gingivectomy code. So that is uh, sort of cutting of inflamed gums. Typically, um, that's, when, that's due to uh, tissue overgrowth where it's covering the tooth surface and interfering with chewing function. And this is a picture of um, one brand of that SDF or silver diamine fluoride over on the right side. So you can see that um, because it's a liquid medication that has a really easy means of uh, applying it, um, you don't, it doesn't produce any aerosols, you don't need to utilize any anesthesia, um, there's no drilling, it's not a painful medication or anything like that to apply, and it's very quick and easy. So again, for some of these patients, especially within um, like a geriatric population, uh, it can be a really good way to address um, some of these concerns with diabetes or complications from diabetes without having to do extensive treatment on patients who may not be able to tolerate it. So as far as um, risk factors and disease management, uh, chronic inflammation, as I've kind of been saying, is a risk factor for devel developing diabetes. And one of the primary ways to reduce inflammation throughout the body is through diet and exercise. So this is kind of on uh, managing those uh, lifestyle factors and things like that in order to manage the disease. So exercise releases anti-inflammatory chemicals into the body, which makes muscle cells more responsive to the insulin as well. So especially in patients who have that non-insulin dependent or type two diabetes, it can be a really big um, benefit um, to do exercise for more than just weight loss. Um, those, when that inflammation starts to die down from these anti-inflammatory chemicals, it can actually make the rest of the body, um, those muscle cells in the body, more responsive to insulin, which can help uh, to control uh, the diabetes outcomes or diabetes uh, signs in these patients. And uh, the, in the increased insulin sensitivity can reduce the chronic inflammation overall. So even moderate exercise like walking can have a pretty profound impact on how we are uh, seeing these chronic effects of diabetes in these patients. And that's one of the primary reasons why um, any primary care physician is going to recommend things like exercise and diet management in uh, patients with type two diabetes. As far as nutrition recommendations, um, there are foods that are kind of categorized into pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory food. I know pro is usually a good thing, um, but since it's increasing inflammation, um, in this case, the pro category is the bad. So anti-inflammatory foods typically include healthy fats, um, things that include omega-3 fatty acids like fish, um, as well as more liquid fats that are found with like olive oil, avocado oil, walnut, other nut oils, things like that. Um, and they're also, of course, found in many fruits and vegetables, including uh, citrus, leafy greens, and then um, other things that um, traditionally have those anti-inflammatory properties like ginger and turmeric um, and things like berries and tomatoes. So we certainly want to make sure that uh, diets are well balanced. Um, one of the things that you'll kind of see over in that anti-inflammatory uh, column is there's a big variety of color, um, and there is a lot of emerging science that's pointing to having that kind of color diversity in your food as being uh, really beneficial to compounding those effects um, for anti-inflammatory as well as other health be benefits. 
in the inflammatory column, um, we have uh, other things like trans fats, trans fatty acids, um, and then shortening animal fats, red meat, and full fat dairy. So obviously these are all kind of the the foods to avoid a little bit more of, or at least eat in moderate um, to low quantities. Um, and that is a good way to uh, also contribute to that inflammation reduction. And I do have kind of a disclaimer at the bottom that just eating an anti, excuse me, just eating an anti-inflammatory diet is not preventive itself for diabetes unless it leads to needed weight loss. So weight loss and physical activity can reduce the systemic inflammation like we've talked about before, um, which is important for reducing that risk of type, type, type 2 diabetes. And as far as some other lifestyle recommendations, the first one that um, I always encourage all of my patients, diabetic or not, but especially within diabetic patients, is stay hydrated. So one of the things that we mentioned on the oral health effects slide was reduced saliva production or dry mouth. So saliva production can be reduced with diabetes, and that will also cause an increase in the glucose concentration. So once that saliva is decreased, then caries or cavities will spread more rapidly. So um, even it'll, it'll increase the risk of getting those cavities in the first place, but it'll also increase the, or it'll decrease the speed with which um, they, it'll accelerate the growth of those cavities, um, which will uh, increase the severity and can sometimes lead to um, an increase in need for things like root canals or extractions because these cavities are spreading um, a lot faster. So this can also, the, the um, dehydrated oral environment can also lead to accelerated bacterial growth, which can also affect plaque accumulation and things like that. So you'll find more deposits, um, which also kind of cover up the tooth surfaces and can also accelerate that tooth decay. Um, other things that can also cause um, problems with diabetic patients are things like smoking and vaping, which can also increase the symptoms of dry mouth as well as kind of introducing other chemicals to the environment. So one of the ways that we sometimes um, help to combat this in a uh, non-pharmaceutical way is by chewing sugar-free gum. It's usually a good first step intervention for some patients because it can help increase saliva production. Um, but uh, the effect of that increased saliva production is going to be moderated a little bit by that systemic inflammation. So if there's more systemic inflammation, you may still not see a marked improvement in um, that saliva production, but it can certainly still be a good first step measure. Um, we do want to make sure that uh, when we are chewing gum, it is a sugar-free gum because otherwise we're going to be kind of contributing to the increased glucose in the saliva. Um, and there are other pharmaceutical saliva replacers that are available uh, when it is more of kind of a moderate to severe dry mouth. Um, and we'll talk about those uh, on a slide in just a couple of minutes here. So the CDC, um, this is directly from the CDC's website, and they recommend um, specifically for diabetic patients, number one is brushing your teeth at least twice a day with a fluoridated toothpaste. So fluoride is going to be the main kind of protective element um, in the toothpaste, the active ingredient that is going to help reduce the risk for cavities. So we want to, of course, make that recommendation to brush twice a day. Um, and if needed, uh, we also do tend to prescribe uh, prescription strength fluoride toothpastes that have a significantly higher concentration of fluoride um, and they can help to minimize the uh, risk of decay in these patients who are higher risk. Um, so especially with patients who have that severe uh, xerostomia or dry mouth as a side effect or a symptom of their diabetes, um, we this is something that I tend to recommend to quite a few patients. Um, and insurance coverage sometimes varies. So depending on whether insurance will cover the toothpaste or a the, the sort of topical application gel um, is just going to determine uh, sometimes what we are recommending. But typically I start with the toothpaste and then if that is insufficient, um, you can use the gel, which usually has a longer duration of action. Um, they also recommend flossing teeth at least once a day, and typically this is because uh, cavities tend to start right at that contact point between two teeth. So 
they these are kind of those areas where if we can prevent the cavity from starting in the first place, it's going to give us much better uh, results. And again, these are recommendations that are pretty good for um, the general population, not just patients with diabetes, but um, they're especially important in uh, patients who will have that kind of accelerated uh, progress of decay. Um, so obviously, you also want to tell your dentist if you have diabetes, because as we've kind of been going through, um, it can certainly impact your dental care. Um, there, that's something that we we never want to be a surprise. Um, we want to make sure that we have a comprehensive health history for all our patients. And diabetes just can come with some more specific clinical guidance that we use on a on an appointment uh, basis. And within this, if your gums are red, swollen, or bleed easily, um, you should see your dentist. Um, again, this one seems like it should be kind of common knowledge, but there are a lot of patients who um, kind of, if they're not actively in pain, um, they won't seek care. But uh, this, these swollen, red, and bleeding gums um, can be big signs of gum disease or periodontitis. And this can lead to um, long-lasting impacts, um, the, the biggest of which is losing your teeth. So as that bone loss um, proceeds throughout the body, or as the, as the bone loss proceeds, um, teeth are, are going to start to get looser and looser, and then it's going to impact um, a lot of other things more so than just, uh, just the bone around the teeth. It'll start impacting a lot of other lifestyle things if all of a sudden it becomes painful to eat on um, on teeth that are starting to get mobile, um, and that can impact other things like uh, overall nutrition if you have to start eating a softer food diet. And finally, um, the CDC recommends uh, quitting smoking or vaping because all of these increase the risk of gum disease um, and will accelerate things like um, dry mouth, and um, they can worsen the diabetes outcomes if you are a smoker. So these are just a couple of examples. Um, I want to make clear that these are not uh, specific brand recommendations from me personally. These are just a couple of things that um, we, a couple of categories of things that we recommend to patients, um, especially ones with diabetes. So the first um, is a category for dry mouth relief. So one of those, um, this is a, a specific company called Biotene. Um, and this is just a couple of their products, but um, in terms of dry mouth relief in general, there are things like pastes. Um, there are uh, toothpastes that have that um, increased uh, saliva, um, or excuse me, there, there are pastes or gels that will kind of stimulate uh, saliva production. Sometimes these are things that you like rub around your gums or rub on the cheeks, um, things like that, that can kind of stimulate saliva production in the mouth. Um, there are also dry mouth rinses, which I think are probably the most common. Um, that biotin dry mouth rinse um, is something that I've had some patients um, who have said it has been um, absolutely life changing to have that um, just added saliva um, in the mouth, which can help um, a number of things and can definitely keep the teeth much healthier. Um, as I also mentioned before, we have that kind of prescription strength fluoride toothpaste. So this is one called Prevident um, by Colgate. And this just has a, it has a, a prescription level of toothpaste or of uh, fluoride. So um, it will again, kind of reduce the impact of, or reduce the speed at which those cavities spread um, by kind of remineralizing or rehardening the outer layers of teeth. Um, the next one is an anti, a prescription antibacterial mouth rinse called chlorhexidine. Um, this is a brand called Paradex, um, which is probably one of the most common. So again, this is something that um, a dentist will typically recommend um, if there are um, a lot of if there's a lot of inflammation in the gums and things like that. Uh, it's a way to kind of decrease the bacterial load um, in between the teeth and the gums in, in this area called the gingival sulcus, um, which is kind of uh, if your if your gums are a little bit puffy, this is just something that can get some um, get some antibacterial compounds down into those areas, which can help to reduce that inflammation. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, uh, sugar-free chewing gum, uh, again, also for kind of reducing the symptoms of dry mouth. So this is a xylitol sweetened chewing gum um, that is called Spry. And that is something that uh, I have recommended to several patients. 
Um, but the most important thing when dealing with care for diabetes um, is a team approach. So we always want to be working in coordination with a patient's physician um, in order to determine the patient's health status, make sure that they're ready to move forward with planned dental procedures, um, and make sure that we can do all of that in a safe and effective uh, manner. So especially, again, for invasive treatments, um, things like extractions, um, those are those are the big things where we almost always want to do some type of a consult with the uh, physician or endocrinologist to make sure that people are on track for um, for their dental care, make sure that they can go through that safely. When necessary, um, physicians can make laboratory tests available to dentists um, and inform uh, the dentist of any potential diabetic complications. So letting us know if a patient has been hospitalized for um, something like a severely high glycemic index before, um, if they've had any of those uh, big episodes of um, things like ketoacidosis. Um, but most commonly uh, what we use is um, we, we like to request uh, patients A1C levels or HbA1c levels so that we can make sure that uh, their sort of benchmark level is under control for uh, for treatment. Um, and less commonly than that, uh, the physician may sometimes need to adjust a patient's medication to help um, kind of improve their control before, during, or after surgical procedures. So again, sometimes this just means increasing dosage of uh, something like metformin in order to kind of make sure that uh, things are, are a little bit better controlled or a little bit better, better balanced um, because of these potential side effects and surgical complications. Um, but again, most importantly, patients with diabetes should make sure that they're obtaining regular medical and dental care because a lot of these things um, can, they can get away uh, from you pretty quickly. So things like cavities and gum disease can advance relatively rapidly in patients with diabetes. Um, so they should make sure that they have a regular dental home. Um, and that's something that Apple Tree Dental has been um, doing some research on. And uh, the, the dental home initiative is one that we certainly want to share with everybody that everyone um, seems to have a much better uh, oral health outcome when they have somewhere that they're going regularly rather than just kind of going to dental appointments for emergency care only. All right, so we'll kind of get into some comments and questions here. But before we do, I also just wanted to um, kind of uh, highlight that the the Journal of the uh, American Dental Association, actually their cover story from this month, which I didn't get a chance to make a slide on it because I just got this um, last week. Um, their cover story this month is on periodontal treatments effect on diabetes healthcare costs. So this is something that is clearly a, a hot topic right now. And um, the study that they're highlighting in there is showing that patients who go through with um, scaling and root planing and other treatment for periodontal disease um, can have decrease, significant decreases um, in overall annual healthcare costs related to diabetes. So again, with working with kind of that bi-directional relationship between periodontitis or gum disease and diabetes, we're starting to see um, more and more evidence that going through these dental treatments is going to provide um, in better lifestyles and better um, healthcare outcomes for these diabetes patients, as well as saving money in the long run um, for their healthcare costs. So I just kind of wanted to highlight that before we start moving into our comments. All right. Okay, Dr. Grants, we have a question here. Could Definitely. a patient use SDF instead of receiving a scaling and root planing? Yeah, so um, typically scaling and root planing is going to be done for um, issues related to hygiene for the most part. So it's it's meant to kind of decrease the bacterial load um, in between uh, in between the gums and the teeth. So it's not going to be dealing with uh, specifically with cavities. 
Um, silver diamine fluoride or SDF treatment is going to be to sort of stop the progress of small decay just on the surface of the tooth. So um, the answer to the question is no. Uh, they're, they're kind of dealing with different processes where one is dealing with the inflammatory factors um, that are causing gum inflammation and bone loss, whereas the other one is working sort of at the tooth level where you're trying to stop uh, the progress of a uh, specific sp uh, site of decay. All right, and we have another question, emergency room related. What do you have for suggestions of when to seek emergency room medical care for dental needs for clients mm -hmm. that aren't able to get in right away with someone for an emergency dental needs? Mm -hmm. um, the dental provider started, um, in southern Minnesota, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's, like that and all that. Yeah. That's right. definitely something I really appreciate that question because that's something that we have been dealing with uh, quite a bit. Um, one of the things that I've been working on in the uh, research and innovations department with Apple Tree is um, looking into medical dental integration. So we're lucky enough to be located inside the Mayo Clinic building. Uh, we share space with them, even though we're not um, technically affiliated. We just rent space from them. Um, so we have some sort of an emergency deferral plan in place, which has been really helpful, um, where if they get patients who are seeking emergency care um, in that department, um, most of the time they are referred over to us for emergency care, which Having having kind of that integrated medical and dental care network um, is really helpful when we do have that opportunity. But most places are not going to be quite that fortunate. And I know this is this is mainly a question to the lack of access. Um, so it's a little bit difficult to answer from a clinical perspective, unfortunately. But certainly um, when dealing with uh, big complications um, from diabetes or from oral health issues. If you're having uh, severe tooth pain, but especially if you're having um, external inflammation, if you have something like an abscess um, that is going on, so a really big kind of inflamed bump in the gums that's causing pus drainage or anything like that, or even more so um, with uh, inflammation that reaches kind of into the jaw or into the cheek or into the eye, things like that. Those are definite areas where um, you want to uh, recommend emergency care uh, first. Most of the time, at least in my experience, these patients will be given painkillers and antibiotics and referred to a dentist. So there is a huge issue um, with access in this area. Um, and that's something that we're trying to work towards um, promoting uh, more, more dental providers um, to come down to Southern Minnesota. That's something that we're, we're kind of actively working towards and, and especially places like Apple Tree where we see um, patients who are largely on public health plans. Um, we're trying to kind of decrease that disease burden um, in, in Southern Minnesota by accepting any, any insurance plan, any payer plan. Um, so I don't know if that really specifically answers that question for you, um, but it is a difficult, a difficult field to be in, um, or a difficult position to be in for those patients, and it, it speaks to a little bit of a larger lack of access in this area um, with that provider shortage. Okay, hopefully that answered. Mm -hmm. Um, just a comment some of from someone some of my patients do not want to visit a provider for preventative care because everything is fine it rather um, mm -hmm. until they experience pain you know wait mm -hmm. um, so just a kind of a comment there that someone left yeah definitely that's that is a perspective that we encounter sometimes and um, we certainly can't force uh, we can't force anybody to look into care um, we can't force anybody to visit our offices um, but certainly um, engaging in things like patient education whenever possible um, is definitely a good thing I know um, in my experience as well there are also a lot of issues with um, dental anxiety. That that seems to be something that um, most patients, many patients have had um, adverse experiences with dentists in the past. And that's something that um, causes them to uh, not seek care until they're actively in pain. 
Um, and obviously that's a cycle of um, a cycle that we would also like to break as well. Um, there are a lot of, there's a lot of emerging things about um, more pain-free dentistry um, and techniques like that, that are starting to be taught in schools. Um, so kind of minimizing those negative experiences and optimizing the experiences of your patients, as well as educating patients about the potential um, oral, health, oral health impacts of delaying treatment um, is also a very important thing. Great. And a question about dentures. What would you say to patients who think they don't need to see a dentist because they have dentures? Um, yeah, so the the number one thing um, that we look to for that, um, dentures tend to be uh, something that it's not necessarily going to be the perfect prosthesis for your entire life. Um, there are lots of issues with fit um, that we've seen um, that if a denture has stopped fitting very well, um, there are certainly things that can be done for that, um, like either remaking the denture or doing relines. Um, which is where they kind of rework the internal structure of the denture so that it adapts to the tissue better. Um, but as far as uh, sort of possible adverse effects that can come from not seeking care, um, one of the number one things that we do um, in edentulous exams is look for signs of oral cancer. Um, so that's something that, especially with an aging population and in populations that are taking a lot of medications, um, oral cancer is something that is on the forefront of, of all of our exams. So we're, we're looking at um, areas around the tongue for any kind of spots or sores, things that are non-healing. Um, so that's one thing that um, I would definitely recommend to those patients who don't feel like they need to come in to seek any care. Um, typically, you're not going to need to come in for uh, quite as much of like a six-month cleaning um, because you don't have those teeth to clean anymore. But um, I usually recommend having patients on an annual recall um, for a shorter exam when they're edentulous. So that also helps to kind of um, answer any, any concerns um, that they have with their denture, any fit issues, things like that, that can be addressed. Um, it also gives us the opportunity to screen for oral cancer um, or for other oral, um, oral conditions. Again, um, things like uh, candidiasis or thrush uh, is a fungal infection that can be secondary to things like ill-fitting dentures. Um, so that's another thing that um, can be a good thing to screen for. Um, and then finally, um, if a denture that is fitting moderately well, but is still kind of shifting around a lot um, over its lifetime, um, it can cause these other things, which are called epulous fissuratum, um, which is basically sort of excess tissue folds, um, which is uh, sort of keratinized tissue or hardened tissue on the surface that starts um, starts kind of forming uh, shapes, um, uh, uncommon shapes uh, around sort of the edges of the mouth um, or on the ridge where the dentures are constantly rubbing. Um, and those can be things that also require surgical excision in order to have a denture that fits better. So again, kind of um, treating some of those problems preventatively um, and and helping to do a reline um, or make other adjustments to dentures can be beneficial for for more than just the patient comfort. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. And then just about sedation, is there sedation options or for yeah. patients? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so typically, um, I think that's that's more of a question for somebody who has an oral surgery background than I do. Um, but we we certainly do um, recommend some patients for sedation dentistry, um, especially with considerations um, if they have really poorly managed um, diabetes, um, if they have like uh, things like an A1C level of above 10, um, something like that. Um, that would be something where there are, are sort of too many variables for a lot of general dentists to be comfortable doing surgery um, because of issues like delayed uh, delayed healing, um, which can cause kind of other issues, um, opportunistic infections and things like that can come around when healing is delayed for too long. Um, so there are definitely options for sedation, um, and typically things like that are going to be left to oral surgeons. Um, so if there's a patient who's especially high risk 
for some of those post-operative management concerns. Um, typically, we go to somebody uh, like an oral surgeon who has both a medical and a dental background in order to kind of be able to manage those things more appropriately. And you kind of touched on mouthwashes, but are there benefits to diabetes management patients of mouthwash if we use BID to decrease bacterial load? Like, is there any preferable brands or um, recommendations? Yeah, it's one of those things where um, the brand recommendations are going to be a little bit dependent on um, kind of what the individual patient's condition is. Um, if you do need things to combat um, something like dry mouth, um, we're going to be wanting to gravitate towards something like biotin. Um, if we're seeing lots of lots of tissue inflammation, um, then we're likely going to be recommending a prescription strength mouthwash, um, like we talked about on that product slide, um, like a chlorhexidine, Paradex um, type of thing. Um, but otherwise, um, I don't have any sort of specific brand recommendations for uh, patients with diabetes over another uh, category of patients, no. Um, I tend to recommend that especially patients with diabetes and other high-risk uh, patients for dry mouth stay away from alcohol-based mouthwashes. Um, so that's alcohol can also have kind of a drying effect on the tissue. And it's a good thing to avoid um, if you're high risk for dry mouth. Sounds good. And is there, so if you don't have teeth, is there mm -hmm. kind of a, a certain approach to getting an appointment or what person would ask mm -hmm. when they're going to get an appointment? Um, yeah, absolutely. So if you if you no longer have any teeth, um, then you can there's uh, kind of different coding uh, that can be put in place for an initial exam for an edentulous patient. Um, but typically at that intake, um, we sort of ask questions if they have any previous history with dentures. Um, and that kind of gives us a little bit of an indication um, as to whether they're going to be looking for new dentures, um, if they're happy with the set that they already have, how old that set might be. Um, it kind of helps us to, uh, to gear up for that appointment a little bit better, engage that patient's expectations. Um, but yeah, if you're, if you're looking for an exam um, when you no longer have teeth, that's certainly something that um, I would convey to the intake staff, um, to the, the sort of front staff um, at, at any office that you were looking into. Um, as well as kind of letting them know what the history with dentures has been, if that's something that you're pursuing. Okay, I'm just checking. See, oh, I guess I have one. Yeah, it says uh, a lot of time, the out-of-pocket cost of sedation dentistry is a, a large barrier for clients getting extractions completed so that they can start the process of getting dentures mm -hmm. um, and basically just wondering if there's funding or resources, things like that out there. Yeah, that's, um, that's something that unfortunately I'm not going to have a specific answer to. Um, it, there are occasional cases where um, if a patient has um, systemic issues, they can submit an appeal through medical insurance um, for four types of procedures like that. But I think those typically are going to cover the, the procedure costs rather than the sedation cost. So that is definitely still a barrier. Um, and that, yeah, that's something I, I don't know the answer to if there are any kind of fundable opportunities out there for specifically sedation for things like extraction cases. Um, here's kind of a specific mm -hmm. question about gastroparesis, a diagnosis of a, a patient. Um, mm -hmm. And then if the person vomits frequently, they're being told not to brush their teeth right away mm -hmm. um, to avoid the increased risk for caries. Um, yeah. Does that make sense or? Yeah, so this is um, this is a little bit of kind of an acid-base chemistry um, question. So it, with um, with sort of uh, expectant mothers, uh, pregnant uh, patients, as well as patients who have other kind of frequent uh, vomiting issues with um, any type of uh, gastroenteritis or or GERD or any type of other other um, kind of frequent vomiting conditions like those. 
um, they are at basically the the bile and everything that's coming up from that is going to severely decrease the pH. It's going to make the um, the saliva um, much more acidic. Um, so when the when that area is acidized like that, um, it's going to increase bacterial activity, um, and the the bacteria that are increased are the ones that cause decay. Anytime we're using um, something like uh, toothpaste um, fluoride, the the chemical process that happens is there are sort of um, things that are stripped from the tooth before they're rebuilt. Um, so within that, um, if you have a severely acidic environment um, prior to brushing your teeth, this is the same reason why typically it's not recommended to brush teeth within about 20 minutes of eating a meal either. Um, if the oral environment is that acidic, it's going to potentially increase uh, the invasion of those bacteria into the teeth, into the enamel when the structure is weakened. So we always like to make sure that the, the acid in the mouth is buffered uh, before kind of moving forward to those hygiene things. So typically um, the recommendations for that frequent vomiting is to drink water or drink alkaline water. Um, after vomiting and then wait about 20 to 30 minutes before um, trying to use something like a fluoride mouthwash or toothpaste. I don't have, and just kind of a general question um, mm -hmm. around resources for diabetic patients mm -hmm. um, or anything like that, that they might be able to take advantage. Um, like for example, costly fillings versus um, instead of getting dentures. Um, mm -hmm. There's any specific care to that or resources? Um, specific care as far as uh, types of dental procedures to, to engage in, I would say that that's a little bit kind of, that's those type of treatment plans are going to be at the discretion of the dentist um, for the most part. Um, if the if the dentist is presenting um, specific options for uh, extensive treatment versus um, something like removing teeth and getting dentures, um, there are definitely some things to think about. And I would say that some of those are on a little bit of a case by case basis. Um, so the recommendations are going to change person to person. Um, yeah, I think as far as specific resources for preventive measures, there, there are plenty of those out there. Um, there are things like uh, the, the CDC recommendations that I had shared, um, which I think I have, a, I have a resource that I can share afterwards. I'm, I apologize for not embedding it in the presentation as well. Um, but yeah, there, most of those resources are going to be focused on preventative care rather than sort of specific uh, procedure recommendations. Um, but in terms of just sort of general guidance, when dealing with patients who are at high risk for cavities, um, again, if, if there's a patient who you're looking at maybe like a full mouth reconstruction with, um, with multiple crowns and cavities on every tooth and severe bone loss, um, there are certainly cases like that where it's going to be more worth it and better for the patient um, and the patient care experience in general um, to move towards something like dentures. Um, but that's by by no means universal. There are certainly plenty of other patients where if the decay is still treatable um, and if they are still at a position where that periodontal therapy and things like that can stabilize the dentition, um, then there, there are lots of reasons to avoid moving towards dentures prematurely. Okay. I don't know if that answered the question. Yeah, I don't know if that was uh, the specific guidance you were looking for, but I'll see if there are any other resources that I can attach after the, the presentation. Yeah, that sounds good. And one more question here. We've got time for just a couple more. Yeah, sounds um, good. A diabetic member that drinks a can of soda daily um, and is it going to continue that? <laughs> is it better for teeth to drink from a straw or not? Or is there any anything to that? Yeah, so the um we we've definitely heard this, and for the most part, um it is it's a little bit of a myth that it's better to drink as far as cavity development, um, because you're still going to get that uh that increased sugar concentration, increased acidity in the mouth. 
Um, so from a bacterial standpoint, they don't really care. Um, they're, they're going to cause cavities the same way. Uh, from a staining perspective, it can occasionally be better to avoid staining on front teeth um, to drink through a straw compared to uh, just sipping it out of the can. Um, as far as the recommendations from uh, my nutrition perspective uh, in, in looking at that relation to oral health, um, one of the main things that, again, kind of talking about the acid-base chemistry of saliva is you want to really give the mouth an opportunity to come back to the neutral or slightly basic environment in order to reduce the risk of decay. So when drinking that um, that can of soda, I, I know that that's something that lots of people enjoy. Um, my recommendation to patients typically is to do that at a mealtime. Um, there are studies out there that show that the frequency with which you consume sugar matters more than the specific amount. So of course, increased sugar consumption in general is going to lead to or is going to um, contribute to cavity development. But if you're giving the body time to buffer the pH and get it back to that neutral level um, in between mealtimes, and you're just keeping those kind of doses of sugar intake at three or four times a day, um, typically you're going to have a little bit better outcomes um, because the the environment in the mouth is going to be in a in a sort of acidity level where the bacteria that cause cavities aren't thriving for more hours of the day. So again, kind of keeping that soda um, at meal times is is a better recommendation, and then drinking water and things like that in between meals. All right, and I think that's all the questions, I believe. I think so. Just wanted to remind everybody that just placed in the chat, you can take the evaluation and then that's how you'll receive your certificate. And then also we will post the slides um, to the website and the recording. Um, it does take about a week to get that all, the recording out there um, and available, but otherwise a lot of comments on saying thank you and yeah, we really, it was a really great presentation and really appreciate you taking the time. To Absolutely. Do this Thank today. you so much yeah. for, um, for all joining us. And I really appreciate the collaborative for bringing me in to uh, provide some of this information from the, the clinical perspective. Yes. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.